approach. Hello. It's great to be here at this conference, and it's great to be together at any meeting after two years of being pretty much at home. Uh, what did you guys over, do over those two years? Well, a lot of what I did was writing books. So first I did this, the fourth edition of the AI textbook with my uh, co-author, Stuart Russell. And then with a different set of co-authors, I wrote this book on uh, data science. And so I think I was asked to be here today to give you an overview of what we found in looking very carefully at these two fields of AI, machine learning, and in data science, and where we feel the field is today and where it might be going. So I started off in about 1980 when uh, AI was defined as mostly expert systems. Around 1995, we felt there was a real revolution where things were changing to intelligence assistance. And today, there's another revolution where we're changing to these foundation models. And the technology changed. We went from logic-based to probabilistic to now weight-based. Uh, the approach to writing system has changed from handwriting. It was the blood, sweat, and tears of graduate students so writing things by hand that got things done. And now it's mostly machine learned. We started off thinking algorithms were the key. Then we thought it was data. And now we're really at the point where we say, yeah, we got those things under control. But the hard part now is actually figuring out what is it that we're trying to optimize? What's our objective function? What are we aiming for? What's uh, fair and right? What should we be aiming for? And getting the tools to figure out how to say that and how to get that right, that's where the challenge is today. And the algorithms and data, they kind of keep track of themselves. So that's how the field has changed. Now, for our data science book, we tried to put together a rubric to say, if you're doing a data science project, here are the things you want to worry about to say, is my project going to be successful? So obviously, you've got to have some data. It's got to be the right kind of data. You have to have some technical approach, some algorithm that, that you think is appropriate to the task. You've got to worry about this uh, idea of, of dependability. So it's not just, can I get the right answer some of the time? It's, have I figured out privacy and security? And uh, do I have defenses against abusers who will try to attack my system? Do I have resilience ag against these problems? And can I make the system understandable? So it's not just, do, am I getting the right answers? It's, can I prove that to my users and win their trust through explanations and reproducibility of, of uh, results? Can I tolerate failures? And then these big questions of ethical, legal, and societal implications and getting those right. Things that, when I started my career, we weren't worried about those. We're saying, you know, we're just doing this academic thing. We don't really have an impact on society. And now we have an impact on society every day. And these things move to the forefront. Now, out of all this, everybody kind of focused in on the technical approach, saying, uh, yeah, that's the hard part. All these other things, sure, I got to worry about those. But it's a technical approach. So what do we have to say about that? Uh, well, you've heard a lot today about uh, machine learning pipelines. And uh, that seems important. And I do a lot of work uh, working with startup companies and advising them in their uh, machine learning. And we teach them uh, to think of things this way. You're going to explore the data, identify data sources that you might want to use, curate it. Maybe you need to supervise this data by uh, labeling it through crowdsourcing or something else. And then you've got to evaluate and debug your models and now adapt this to your business needs, deploy it, serve it, and monitor it. You've heard a lot about tools to do that today. And then continuously modify and improve. And so again, there's this big pipeline. And again, everybody focuses in and says, uh, well, this is going to be the hard part. And we actually ask these teams, as they're getting started with their projects, where do you think you're going to end up spending most of your time? What do you think is going to be the hard part? And almost unanimously, they say, well, the hard part is going to be that machine learning model. There's all these complicated uh, Greek letters of sigmas and uh, partial derivatives and all these matrices and so on. So that's going to be really hard. And this other stuff, I think I understand. That's just data. I've done that before. 
So that's the preconception. Once they start working on it for a while, it almost invariably changes to say, you know what? The machine learning model part, that was actually easy. There are great tools for that. But it was wrangling the data up front. That was the hardest part. And then actually serving it and maintaining it and monitoring it, that was pretty hard too. So they completely reverse where they think the problems are. And that's where the tools should be. Now, why was the machine learning model so easy? And I think one of the reasons is, is that these models are differentiable. So if you have an error coming out, you can differentiate backwards and you can eliminate that error or reduce that error. And it goes all the way back from the output to the models to the input. But notice, that's just for this one small part of the whole pipeline. And I think if we're going to make progress as a field, we really want this whole pipeline to be differentiable. So what do I mean by that? I mean, when there's a change in the world, you want the pipeline to be able to update and say, now I'm going to do something else. So what does that mean? Well, up front, these steps one through four, this was figuring out your data sources and curating the data and cleaning the data and so on. And you make some choices doing that. You say, for this data, I'm going to throw out this field. I'm going to average this. So I'm going to add in such and such. And let's say you made the perfect choice for that of, uh, of how you should manage that data. Now you deploy it and everything works. But six months from now, the world has changed. And maybe that choice is no longer the right one. But there are no automated tools to say, let's go back. And this is the, ch the choice point that you should revisit. And I think we need to, help to start building those tools so we can go end to end and figure out uh, what the best approach is, what we have to change, how we're going to improve continuously. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why these large foundation models are so successful is because they are end to end in one large system rather than being composed of a lot of components. So that's a challenge for our field. Now, I said that these ethical considerations are, are very important. In our data science book, uh, we went back to the Belmont report, which was a reply to some of the ethical challenges in the medical profession, where there were experiments that were done unethically in the, in the 70s and before. And this report came up with, with three main uh, aspects that everyone should consider. It's respect for persons. So, People should have the right to act autonomously, which meant informed consent for experiments and so on, and, uh, and other applications for data science applications. Beneficence, do no harm, mitigate the risks. And justice, that everybody should be treated fairly. And if there are risks and benefits, we want, we want to allocate them equally across people. Now, how are we going to do that as a field? And I think that's a real challenge for us. I think the first place it starts is with self-regulation, that companies have to be doing a good job to win the public's trust. They have to put in place uh, their own set of guidelines and, and adhere to them and monitor them and make sure they're doing the, the right job to build systems that are fair and mitigate risk and harm. There's always going to be some government regulations, things like uh, GDPR and so on, and we have to ad adhere to them. There's going to be professional societies, so the ACM and other engineering societies say, here's what it means to be an ethical engineer. <coughs> and I think there's going to be third-party certification. <coughs> so if you think back 100 years or so, there was a, a new technology that was exciting and powerful, but also a bit scary, and that's electricity. And uh, things were exploding. And so <coughs> underwriters' laboratories came in and say, uh, we're going to put a stamp on your toaster that says this is not going to kill you. And that won a lot of public trust. People believed in that because it wasn't just coming from the manufacturers. It was coming from a, a neutral third party. And it turns out that this month, I actually joined underwriters' laboratory advisory board. And they're uh, spinning up a new effort on AI safety. Uh, so so uh, I, I saw that analogy. Uh, uh, and then I was really surprised to learn that they were actually doing it and was happy to be able to join them. Now, what can we say about these foundation models? So the first is they're based on an amazing technology. And in fact, I'm demonstrating that technology. So I'm wearing this shirt 
which uh, reproduces the cave paintings at Lascaux. So this was one of the first times in which the human race said, we're going to represent something and we're going to write it down in a format that can be read later on. And first it was through art, and later it was through written language. And that's how foundation models work. Because there's so much that has been written down in the, in the forms of photos and in the forms of the printed word, and all we have to do is read that, and we learn an amazing amount about society and the world. So that's the technology that's most amazing. Yeah, there's data science and AI stuff, that's cool too. But the fact that we as a species wrote all this stuff down, that's what's really incredible. So it's based on this big data. Uh, it has the advantage of being unsupervised, so you don't have to spend a lot of time labeling. It's multimodal. We have uh, uh, text and images, and in some cases, we're starting to have video. We probably need another advance in computing power to be able to really take advantage of all the video uh, in the world. It's multitask. You can ask questions, you can summarize, you can solve problems, you can translate from one language to another, all these different tasks all through one model. Uh, it's still improving with scale. So every few months, you see somebody comes out, and they built a new model, and it's bigger, and it turns out to be better. Eventually, we got to expect this to asymptote out, but it hasn't happened yet. And it's all based on this fill-in-the-blank technology. So I fill in what, what word should go there? Well, that would be a good word to, to, to fill in there. So the, all, that's all these models do, is you cover up one of the words and say, guess what word is there? And when it gets good at guessing, it's good at doing all these other tasks, too. It's just incredible. And every week or so, it seems like foundation models are doing something that people said they could never do, saying, uh, yeah, they're good at doing this, but they'll never be able to really reason. They'll never be able to do explanation. Here's an example of explaining a joke. Not a very good joke. Uh, the joke is, did you see that Google just hired an eloquent whale for their TPU team? It showed them how to communicate between two different pods. And the AI model responds, so the reason that's funny is because pods can mean either a pod of whales or a, a pod of computer chips. So again, not too funny, but a pretty good explanation to the degree that it is funny. OK. so. We've got to get the ethics of foundation models right. We've got to think about uh, protected groups. And how do you do that? Well, first decide on what groups uh, deserve this kind of protection. And I think that should go by self-identification. And, and we want to allow people to self-identify and then work on those groups. Uh, measure the benefits and harms per group. And adjust the system to mitigate those harms. And I want to point out that, that just race and gender blindness won't work. So, you know, the first thing you might think of is saying, well, I've got a database column. I'm going to delete the, uh, the race and gender column, and then I can't have any bias. Uh, but that doesn't work because the other columns predict those columns. And so you're just building in that bias. So we've got to go beyond that. Uh, and things like federated learning, differential privacy, and homomorphic encryption will help in a ways that, that we can gather this data and we can work on it without having a, uh, a target of a data set that could be uh, uh, open to attack. OK, so what are some of the, the types of things that we want to be able to protect against? Uh, well, one is <coughs> users asking questions that we, that, uh, we don't want to engage in or we, or we want to uh, stop or uh, stop those users from using the system in the wrong way. <coughs> so what do they say? Uh, what do you think of uh, Soros in, in triple parentheses? Now, if you had sanitized all the input to take away all the, uh, the stereotype stuff, you'd say, what, what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, but if you've trained on everything and then told the system the difference between good and bad, then it could say, you know, I, I think this is a uh, trope for uh, an anti-Semitic attack, and I don't want to engage in this. Or if you ask the system, design a virus that will kill people, uh, if it knew a lot of biochemistry, maybe it could say, oh, I got a great idea. But we have to tell the system that that's not OK. Or write an untraceable ransomware program. Uh, these large models are getting pretty good at writing programs now. It's got to know that that's beyond what it's supposed to do. And so we're learning new ways to uh, program these systems 
and we have this incredible tool, and now we have to learn how to, how to control it by uh, prompt engineering, by coming up with better inputs, by chaining models together and so on. We have a lot of tools. It's going to be a brave new world of trying to figure out how to control those tools. So I started out writing code by hand, then I started uh, building uh, uh, small-scale models, and now we have this new tool, and we have to learn how to tame it. And I think we're, we're building an exciting set of uh, a tool chain to be able to do that. So thank you. Thank you.